Hi, this is Tim Hamilton, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I'm here with a crab cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? Well, it's not quite a full episode. It's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. Make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes. Go there now. Well, I'm on the phone right now with John Shields, who's calling in from his restaurant up in Baltimore, who was just in Chicago. John, of course, is the ambassador of the Chesapeake Bay. And if you have a cookbook in your home that it has to do with Chesapeake Bay cooking or even Maryland cooking, it's John's book. John, uh, thanks for calling in. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be with you, Tim. As I told you before we jumped into this, I'm actually a pretty big fan because I, I am an amateur cook, but I'm one of those amateur cooks who thinks he's better than everyone else. And I'm a pretty big gardener, too, and I understand that that's a big part of your restaurant. So I want to get your take on everything that you do to kind of create the cuisine that you celebrate in your books and on your TV show and your blogs and, and everything you do. Oh, great. So, John, you, of course, you've written three books, or this is your fourth book that you put out. The newest one is The New Chesapeake Kitchen, and you that came out last yeah. October. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the. Uh, I think it's the fourth or fifth um, Chesapeake uh, book that I've written, and uh, then I did one uh, called Coastal Cooking, where we traveled all over the coastal U.S. But I've been primarily all Chesapeake uh, for for way many years now. <laughs> you got your start. I was reading your bio, and it was really interesting to me. So you went to uh, music school. You went to uh, Peabody. I did. Yeah, yeah I went. To, well, went part-time to Peabody and uh, yeah I was playing piano for quite a while the piano bar guy you're, you're, you're doing the Billy Joel thing and then you went to uh -huh. Cape Cod because you wanted to be I, I will not going to say musician you want to be a rock star just a rock star I'm, there is no reason to be a musician you just go right to go right for it and you're you going know, I want to so be a rock star so where do I go Cape Cod Cape Cod that's right. where most people go I right. imagine you know James Taylor must have gone there or somebody did right. <laughs> and they have a they have a great culinary tradition up there that I prefer actually more than southern food and it's probably not a whole lot different than ours here um, you know it's coastal a lot of shellfish um, and yeah. you, you kind of yeah. jumped into it up there I did. I mean, you know, obviously I grew up here on the Chesapeake and, and my great uncle uh, ran the Tillman Island Seafood Packing Plant. So I had kind of a background, you know, in, in Maryland seafood. But um, when I got up to Cape Cod and actually started cooking professionally, it was like a whole nother world because it was a small town and um, it was all primarily Portuguese fishermen. And the seafood was really amazing. You know, I hadn't been that familiar with cod before and scrod and the gorgeous scallops and the, the calamari and stuff. Uh, so it was a whole different thing to see the, all, all the fish coming right off the boats. And also, um, again, since it was Portuguese, uh, a lot of European uh, cooking traditions uh, went along with that. So it was a great place to get started cooking and, and, and learn some, some good techniques from people who really knew what they were doing. So you didn't go to culinary school. You kind of just jumped in and just baptism by fire. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's kind of how I trained. You know, I worked in New York for a while and then I went out to California. And so I did, you know, kind of internships um, and apprenticeship things. And, and that, that's how I learned. I learned on the job. Well, the California thing interested me because when I was reading your bio, it said that you were part of the New American Food Revolution. And I'd read about that. You know, I'd read a lot about cooking, and that's one of the basics that, that changed food in the country, that whole revolution that came out of California. But I never quite understood exactly what it meant because it was kind of esoteric. So that was essentially taking regional foods and creating like an American cuisine, sort of like a continental cuisine, but it was kind of combining all yeah. the various regions of the country. Exactly. You know, when, uh, when I went out there uh, in the uh, 70s, um, that's kind of when, you know, like Alice Woodruff had just started um, Chez Panisse and Bruce Adele's the, the Sausage King was out there. And, <laughs> and I thought it was uh, Abe Froman, the Sausage King. And, and so it was just, nope. you know, a whole group of people. And we called it the Berkeley Gourmet Ghetto. So there are all, <laughs> all sorts of people doing amazing things. But the one common denominator was none of us had any culinary background. We all um, you know, had come from different disciplines, you know, academia, um, musicians, but there was this great passion for food. And we had all these marvelous uh, farmers right there. And, you know, you had the Central Valley and access to all kinds of food. So people were just cooking and going crazy. And it was at a time where all these people that had come to California had come from different backgrounds and different traditions. And they started thinking about where they came from and like I did from the Chesapeake and thinking, hey, 
we love the food that we grew up with, and this is a distinct cuisine, and I'm going to you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook it. I want other people to experience it. So it really, you know, gave uh, American cooking this sense of location and making it a valid cuisine. You know, we weren't second class to, to Europe or any other place anymore. We, we, you know, we have a valid way of cooking. Well, it's kind of interesting to me because when I think I grew up in Maryland as well, and I grew up in central Maryland, and so we were outside, just right outside D.C., and I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and we had touches of the cuisine of like, the Chesapeake, but maybe not as defined as you move closer to the Bay. And I think the people who live around the Bay, especially before probably the 1980s, before the homogenization of the country really began in earnest, is that they were probably self-aware about the, the culinary traditions they had, or at least they were aware of it. Sort of like I lived in the Southwest too, and they're very aware of their culinary traditions there, whereas in other places of the country, they just don't think about it. Maybe in the South a little bit, um, they think about their their cuisine, everything from sweet tea to grits. And I think it forces you when you're doing this fusion thing with other other chefs and other cooks where they're saying, all right, what is your culinary background from, from your upbringing? And it, make, it forces you to think about that and define that. Uh, you know, yeah, for example, yeah. we go to Ireland every two years and Maryland fried chicken is on every single menu in every restaurant in Ireland. Maryland fried chicken. But <laughs> my kids wouldn't know what that is. And anyone under the age of probably 50 doesn't know what that is. That's something that disappeared. I know. I mean, it- it is. It's an old, literally, Maryland tradition here. And actually, I made it over in Ireland because I go to Ireland once or twice every year. And uh, I was down in West Cork. And, oh, we had a and that's the culinary capital I, of Ireland, too. Yeah. And I made a big uh, Maryland pan fried chicken dinner mm-hmm. down there. And uh, we, we had a great time. People loved it. And, and, for and we, I, did crab, we did crab cakes, but we used them from, uh, we used Irish crab. It's very good. Yeah. The shellfish yeah. there is excellent because the waters are clear, oh. but they're fantastic. And the scallop, it's funny, the, yeah, the scallops, they're very different than here because they still have, you know, the rest of the body on it. It took a while to get the hang of it. Yeah, they do. It still has a coral on it and everything. It's delicious. So from what I understand, let's, since we're talking about it, Maryland fried chicken is a cent because you, you can't get that in Maryland anymore and no one knows what it is, but essentially you're not deep frying, you're, you're frying it in a covered pan that's with like an inch or two of oil. So it's frying and steaming at the same time, right? Yeah. It's almost like broasted chicken. Broasted. Because <laughs> yeah. you are. And, you know, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You know, because we put the the lid on it, you think it would make soggy chicken, but it isn't. You, you know, you're putting the chicken in that's been marinated in buttermilk for a couple of days. Um, you're putting it into a very hot oil, and then you're reducing the temperature. You know, you, so you're essentially you're searing the outside of the chicken because you're putting it into hot oil. Then you reduce the temperature and you put a lid on it, and so it's kind of steaming it at the same point. And uh, it makes for just, you know, the most tender, moist chicken imaginable with a whole lot of flavor as well. Why can't you get that anymore? I mean, do you see like the culinary traditions of Maryland? Because we are a transient area now, especially with Washington, D.C. in such close proximity. Do you see a lot of like the culinary traditions of the area kind of fading? Well, you do. I mean, because I, I think, you know, cuisines evolve. And I also think that, you know, with, you know, American cooking now, you know, because we have everything on the Food Network. And um, so a lot of it is kind of homogenized and, you know, kind of lost some of the distinct flavor. But there there still are people and there still are, you know, that do the fried chicken. It's a pain because it's a little bit messy. It takes some time and dedication to do it. We do it at, at my restaurant, but we only do it one day a week because, again, it takes a good bit of work and uh, there's a lot of labor in it and a lot of love. So uh, maybe we don't have enough time for love right now. <laughs> We need more. <laughs> well, so we, we talk about something that's obscure, like Maryland fried chicken. And when you think about Maryland cuisine, you generally go right to crab cakes, and that's your ground zero. Yeah. Everyone has their, their recipe. But what is a more obscure category of uh, dishes in Maryland cuisine that we don't think about anymore? Well, I mean, I, you know, one of the ones that always comes to mind for me that you, you don't see very much anymore is the St. Mary's County stuffed ham. I have no idea what that is. That's just one of the best things I think that ever came out of Maryland. I know. What is it? Um, okay. So it's what you're doing is you're taking a fresh ham. Um, not you know, smoked or not cured. Smoked. No, it's just first. And then you're brining it. And then they call it a corned ham. Uh, because you know you're using uh, pickling spices and kind of corning. Oh, like corned um, beef, right? 
Yeah, like a corn for a corned beef. And you um, bone that out, you know, it's boned and it's tied. And then you're taking, oh my God, tons and tons of kale and greens, um, hot red peppers, mustard seeds, onions, green onions, and chopping them like chopping like you're going crazy. Um, and then you take all that raw greens and that whole mixture, and then you take like a boning knife and you make deep slits into the ham on both sides, like half moon slits. And then you take the greens and you're stuffing as much as you can in all of these slits on both sides of the ham. And then you take a um, or sometimes the, down in Southern Maryland, they use a, a, a T-shirt that they cut open and they put the ham in it and, and then tie the whole thing up in that. And then they poach it. Uh, it goes into a big pot and it poaches for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And then it cools in the pot. Then you refrigerate it overnight. And when you slice it, you slice it and serve it cold and you slice it very thin. And there's like all these veins of green running through the ham. I have never and heard of this. Absolutely delicious. And um, it's often served with uh, biscuits or um, beaten biscuits, the, um, the, the Maryland beaten biscuits. And you just put that on there with maybe a little mustard or a little honey mustard. And uh, it's some of the best thing that you probably ever could imagine. And it's an interesting dish because it's really the coming together of two worlds. You know, you have the hams and the corning of the hams, which is very English. And then you have this whole thing with all the greens and the hot peppers and the spices, like from the West Indies, which is African. And so it, this, this happened on the plantations, these two traditions of cooking uh, in, in Southern Maryland came together. And uh, so the, the St. Mary's County stuffed ham is, you know, like iconic down there. I have never heard of that. So, yeah, you have to check it out one time. I did I did it on one of my television shows, Just Be Bay Cooking, and uh, it's a sight to behold. You want to do it with a bunch of people. It's like a family affair, huh. getting everybody to, together to do it. It's, it's pretty marvelous. Again, it takes some time, and it's usually served around the holidays, either at, uh, around the Christmas time or around uh, Easter. But uh, if you haven't done it before, uh, you should do it because it's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. I think you would enjoy it. Well, the regional cuisine, because Maryland's a very small state when, when you think about it and uh, geographically. And, you know, I, I was down in southern Maryland not too long ago, and I was down in Charles County. And I was just thinking about, you know, I was telling my kids, I said, well, Maryland used to be somewhat southern. I mean, we are the middle child. We're not southern. We're not northern. We're definitely coastal. But, you yeah. know, our identity is a little bit tricky when you try and look in the larger context of like the East Coast. But when I was in, and I was telling my kids, I said, when I was younger, there was definitely more of a Southern touch to Maryland than there is now. But if you go to like Charles County and St. Mary's down there, I mean, you get great barbecue. It's like, you know, you're in North Carolina or something. And that's something you don't get here, which is only a half hour away, you know, up in Annapolis and Baltimore. And that's just as, you know, Maryland as the Bay. I, I don't know what you would do for Western Maryland. I, there's no cuisine I can identify for that. But I mean, the heart and soul would you would you would think would be the Bay because that's where you know the crabs that we're known for. So if you identify yeah. Maryland cuisine, you have some outliers, but that is what it is. Is this the Bay? Yeah, it is, and um, yeah, you do get that unique, you know, that unique flavor uh, down there. And that's one of the interesting things when I when I first did my first cookbook. Um, on the Chesapeake Bay, it was called the Chesapeake Bay Cookbook years and years and years ago. I um, spent about six months traveling from, you know, up in Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna all the way down uh, to Hampton Roads. And I really was was uh, amazed at the different cuisine, you know, regional differences all the way up and down because there's so many different influences that, of people who settled in particular regions and it really defined um that cooking and so i mean you can still find pockets of that there's not as much because a lot of the small towns are you know kind of gone and like i said there's been a lot of homogenization with the food but you can still find it here and there there's a woman who's down on smith island and for i think most people know it there's a great book i think it's called um, requiem for the chesapeake i think that's what it's called i read it last year and it's about yeah. smith island which is disappearing it's it's um, right 
yeah. in the bay just north of the Virginia line. And they have their own accent that's that fascinates linguists. They have their own culture. Um, they were they're famous a couple of years ago when when President Trump called the mayor uh, because the mayor was talking about um, he, they're in denial about climate change. But they're wonderful people. And yeah. the Smith Island cake, of course, is famous. That's the you know all the layers inside the cake. And there's a woman out there that gives lessons that as a group you make an appointment with her, and I forget how much you pay her. It's very reasonable. You take the ferry over, and she shows your group how to make the Smith Island cake. And that's one of those things that is uniquely Maryland. Oh, but- it is. Yeah, no, I lo- I love it. I have a book that's sitting right on my shelf right here. It's called Mrs. Kitching's Smith Island Cookbook. And Mrs. Kitching was like the first lady of Smith Island cooking. Uh, she passed away a number of years ago. And she had kind of a B&B. And um, all the presidents of the U.S. would come cool. there. I think Winston Churchill went there uh, to, to get her cooking. And I remember I, I had taken the ferry over one day and um, and I said, she said she was making some cake and she was making Smith Island cake. And she goes, have you ever had um, um, Smith Island cake before? And I said, oh, yeah, I had some over uh, on the mainland. She goes, well, that wasn't Smith Island cake. <laughs> well, technically she's right, cake. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it is, it's, my God, it is, it, it is definitely a delicious, uh, a delicious cake. Well, and I guess that's, they are descendants of, direct descendants of the English settlers, you know, which, so their accent is derived from the English, from 17th century English. And it, do, it does, it does. And even, even more so like on Tangier Island right. is, um, is totally like that. And up until not that long ago, up until about 30 years ago or so, linguists from all over the world would come there um, to study the accent because it was the most perfect form of Elizabethan English still spoken in the world. If you're listening to this, go after this, go to YouTube and, and Google Smith Island accent and Tangier Island accent. And there's some great examples that just, it, yeah. it, I, I would say it's funny. It's not funny. You're not laughing, but it's, it's incredible to think that, you know, they're just, a f- you know, like, like just offshore of, of Maryland, which is one of yeah. the wealthiest states in the country or is the wealthiest state in the country. And, you know, so transient and you have this time capsule that's there that's the, yeah. they're disappearing unfortunately but in their way of life yeah, with the crabbing and yeah i mean it's a it is a way of life that is rapidly disappearing and so uh, i definitely anyone that hasn't been there i i, I recommend going down and, and and taking a visit and meeting because they're great people yep. they really are you take a ferry from uh, from point lookout or from cambridge and it's a short ferry ride and they're very they're, like you said they're really nice there's no cars on the island yeah. to but um, so, the, you know, they're crabbers and uh, I think they, they're they big with the soft shell crabs as well. And that is so uh, iconic of Maryland. I mean, we that's something we embrace. Why do we love the crab more than the Carolinians or the, or the New, New Jersey? But it, for us, it's just iconic so much so that we have to bring crabs in from other places because we can't get, sustain it. Why is it so uniquely Maryland? I guess we have to look at it from a geographic region. Um, most of the other places up and down the Atlantic coast, most of them are drawing uh, and and catching their crab, you know, very close off the ocean. But, you know, you have the Chesapeake, which is the largest estuary in North America, you know, and it's running almost 200 miles from north to south and, you know, 3,600, no, 4,600 miles of shoreline. So it gives the crabs all this I mean, it's like it's like the Disney World for crabs, um, and they're perfect growing conditions. And the brackish water uh, gives it the crab here so much flavor, more so than most anywhere else that it goes. So when you think about that, all that shoreline and all those communities and all those towns, the crabs are virtually coming up to to all the towns. In, you know, in, in, in the whole state. So it's a very different proximity that we have had to crab than anywhere else. And this is like the, the largest producer, the Chesapeake is the largest producer of soft shell crabs in the world. Um, and that's just because so much of the reproductive life of crabs happens around here, the sloughing um, and the, the whole process of regrowing the hard shell so um, we, I, I think we're just we're just right in you know dead center of crab world here, and uh, I think that's why it's ubiquitous and why why it's so so well loved here. It drives me crazy though because if you go up to New England, 
like everywhere from New Hampshire north and, and obviously into Maine. But the price of lobster is so inexpensive when you get up there; it's ridiculous. But in here, in the heart of crab country, it's I feel like it's out of out of reach for a lot of normal people. It's become a very special thing you get on very rare occasions because it's so expensive. Even when you have, uh, you know, a bumper crop like we do this year, the prices don't budge, and it's so frustrating. Yeah, it is. Well, you know, it it, it, it obviously it's a supply and demand uh, situation. I don't know if it and, is because even when um, you, the prices don't drop on like years like this, when you have the stock is up seventy percent. And well, the stock the stock is up, but the thing that we we have to and I mean, I, I obviously I have to deal with this every day yeah. because I have a, a of a restaurant, but we don't look at it anymore from a local standpoint of the pricing. It's a worldwide pricing structure now uh, for for crab. So when the prices there's, let's say there's a disruption in Venezuela for crab production because of political issues, so that brings the supply down, the worldwide supply of crab. And so the prices go up everywhere. And it's true here in the in the Chesapeake as well, because they're all based on, you know, it's a world thing now, not a local thing. Do you know where they don't like blue crab? It is Greece. Because apparently, and I was just reading about this last month, I guess in the ballast of one of the ships that went over to Greece from the Chesapeake had blue crabs in it. And now they're spreading like wildfire over there and they don't know what to do with them. And then they're a nuisance species over there. Well, we're going to have to go over and teach them. Right, right. Uh-huh. With some feta? <laughs> we're going to set up some Chesapeake cooking classes over in uh, Greece. Some crab souvlaki <laughs> would be great. It would be lovely. So, crab pasticcio. <laughs> <laughs> now, a big part of what you do is gardening because you have a garden up at your restaurant, which is Gertrude's Restaurant at Baltimore Museum of Art. And uh, we have something like that down here. We have Cafe Breton, which is in uh, Severna Park, or at least uh, I think they're still there. And they had their own kitchen garden. And we have a couple restaurants here in Annapolis. Vin 909 does that. Uh, they have their own garden. I love that you are a big part of that locavore movement, you know, the, buying local local crops, yeah. local produce. Um, and I think I think you I feel like you do taste a difference because you're not trucking stuff in from California or even Mexico that's you know was picked three four weeks ago and you taste a real big difference. You do. It's fresh. I mean, it's just you know that's that that's the whole the whole idea is it's fresh. And so we you know we have a, a kitchen garden that we just have fun with. Um, you, you know, obviously you don't get enough out of the kitchen garden to to have menu items that can last you know, a long season, but you come up with things that you can do as specials, daily specials um, all the time. And so it's a lot of fun. Our chefs really like it. I have one chef, Steve Bowser here, who's just like a gardening maniac. And um, he just spends so much time out back and, you know, everybody hangs out out back. And just to, just to have that proximity is really good. And we, we deal with, you know, we must deal with um, 30 or 40 local uh, farmers and, and artisan food makers all the time. And they come to the restaurant all the time. We go to the farmer's markets and, meet, you know, talk with them and buy from them. And it gives you a whole different appreciation for food when you know the people that actually are growing it and you know their kids and you know their parents and you know that the money goes back into the community and it, it helps the town's thrive and um, families to thrive. When you have those beautiful greens that just come in, um, you don't take them for granted. You know, you, you, you really, you, you can make that connection and, and our chefs feel the same way too. So it, it just gives you a different appreciation for food. It really does. Now, like I said, I'm a big fan of your first three books and the new one, the new Chesapeake Kitchen. Um, you said, we talked about this before we went, we went to start recording, but you said that you were kind of stretching beyond the regular recipes when it comes to Maryland and you're kind of uh, going in a, not in a different direction, but you're kind of going outside the, the realm of the first three books. Yeah, I, I thought that you know the first three books were very rooted in in historical Chesapeake cooking, um, and if you look at a lot of the recipes, they were from the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, which is you know the crux of what we know as as Chesapeake cuisine. But I thought that it was time for me to take a quick look and take stock of where we are with the bay. What do we have in the bay? What don't we have in the bay? What do we have growing around on the farms, the fields? And how could we envision a Chesapeake kitchen for the 21st century? So in doing that, I went out back on the road again, and I, I kind of gave uh, – all my, my food people and farmers and everything out there, this challenge, I said, okay, let's look like a locavore thing. Uh, let's think about in season, 
but I don't want you to put in any dish any more than 20, 25% of it of meat or seafood, hmm. um, that the primary thing needs to be grains and vegetables. And so when everybody started thinking about it, they all they could think about was their grandmothers because it's the way we've always cooked. And it's the way most uh, cultures all over the world have cooked or still do cook. The basis of most of the food is, you know, uh, some sort of grain or starch, a lot of vegetables in it. And Thomas Jefferson had written one time that fish and um, meat should be only used as a condiment on the food. And I mean, he was America's first foodie. So I took that and uh, tried to get recipes that kind of uh, work with that um, because I, I, I call it bay and body friendly food. It's good for the bay because we're taking a little stress off of the bay by not maybe harvesting quite as much um, as we were. Um, and it's good for the body. Uh, <laughs> most studies have told us that, it, you know, eat more fruits and grains and vegetables are going to be good for us. So that was the premise of the whole book. I, I, I call it a little bit more plant forward. It is a great book out, uh, or it came out, I think, last year by Michael Pollan, and it's called In Defense of Food. And he was talking about that, how we, as far as industrialized nations go, we are the heaviest, we are the most unhealthy, we have the most health problems. And he says, because we look at foods now, we break it down to nutrients, you know, all, you know, every proteins and starches and vitamins. And that's how we look at it. We don't look at it as food anymore. And he goes, when we looked at yeah. it as food, then we didn't have the problems that we do now. And it, it's a really, really good book with a lot of good information that kind of touches on oh, what you're I, saying. I love that book. I really love the book. And and I love that in, in, in the beginning of the book, he, he had written, he goes, this is a really long book. I think I've sitting here, worked on it, and it's like 400 pages. Right. But I'm going to give you that going to give away the ending right here in the beginning you know eat food real food not too much and mostly plants and that was his right. whole distillation of the entire of of doing a whole trilogy of work on this michael paul is fantastic he also did the omnivore's dilemma back in 2006 yeah. i think which just changed the way i looked at food and he also did you can change your mind which is a pet project of mine but he's just yeah. he's an amazing guy um, and I think it kind of dovetails into what you're talking about with your newest book, uh, which actually I was reading last night. It's really good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please, well, so you enjoying it. So this is John. You can see John. Uh, go to johnshields.com for his website. He also has a Facebook page. Uh, visit him at his restaurant. He's Gertrude's Restaurant at Baltimore Museum of Art. At blogs. He's got TV shows. He's got everything and, and cookbooks. He's just, John, I'm a big fan, and I'm, I've am i always been a big fan, and I love what you do, and I love what you do for, for Maryland Cuisine, so just keep doing it. And, and thanks for coming on the show, John. This is awesome. Great. Thank you, Tim. All right, great. I look forward to coming up to your restaurant and meeting you. I love that. All right, John. Well, thanks much, and uh, have a great weekend. All right. Well, you do the same, and if you're coming up here, give me a shout because I'd love to meet you and sit and talk. All right, John. Hey, thanks much. Catch you later. All right. Thanks, Tim. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye-bye. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Go.